Hi guys, welcome to our evening celebration here at St. Michael's. My name is Tom, I'm part of the clergy team here and I'm going to be leading this um, half an hour time uh, up till seven o'clock and hopefully you'll join us with uh, our Zoom chat at seven um, as we chat about um, some of the things that we've heard in um, breakout rooms. So. Uh, Sai is going to be leading us in some worship in a minute. Don't worry, it's not just all clergy uh, this evening. Uh, Laura is also accompanying him. And uh, Mrs. Lily Morris is going to be um, giving us our message this evening. Lily got married yesterday. Can you believe it? And um, she's going to be speaking on Matthew 20, 25. We're continuing our series on Jesus' parables, the stories that he told in order to give us a glimpse and insight into the kingdom of God. So we're going to start in a moment with some, um, with some sung worship. Um, so let's prepare our hearts now. I don't know about you, uh, screen spirituality is quite difficult. Some people finding it easier than others. And uh, we need to really engage our hearts with it, I think, um, and try and fix our eyes on Jesus and not on a screen. So let's pray with that in mind. Father, we give you this time. We lay down whatever's in our hearts, whatever's been going on this weekend or in the previous week, we lay it before you now. And we choose to fix our eyes on Jesus this evening. And let's activate our imaginations right now. Let's do that. See if you can picture King Jesus before you now. Standing before you, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace. Let's worship him together. Amen. Better 
is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. We'll 
we thank you that our anchor holds within the veil and our anchor holds Lord because it is rooted in the bedrock of your love and your love never fails and we thank you for that amen thanks I and Laura for taking the time to put that together um, believe me it takes a long time to piece these things together so we're really grateful um, to you um, as I was praying um, earlier, I got a sense that God wants to heal someone with a sore mouth, something to do with maybe dentistry or ulcers or something um, that the Lord would love you to seek prayer for, perhaps um, bring it to prayer, um, bring it to him for healing. So I thought I'd give you that. Around this time in our evening celebration, we say a couple of notices. Most of you will know um, how to access our news on the website. Just to say one thing, um, next Sunday is our drive-in church service at six o'clock at Sainsbury's Filton. And so we'll be able to gather together, wave at each other across a, a car park and sing some songs actually um, together. If you haven't managed to get a, a, a place or a ticket at the time of filming this, there really weren't that many left. So I don't know by Sunday whether there will be any left, but you can access that service um, online via Facebook at that time. So uh, more information on, on the website. Over to Lily in a moment. She's going to be speaking um, on Matthew 25. And that is, if you want to check out uh, and get your Bible to hand, it's Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. As I said uh, earlier, Lily got married on Saturday, as in yesterday. So uh, there can't be that many brides who are able to knock, knock out a, a preach on the week of their wedding. But Lily is one of them. And so we're grateful to her. Can you imagine preaching? You're actually preaching, Lily, although I hope you're not watching this because this is the first day of your married life. I don't think that should be right. Uh, but uh, anyway, you're preaching on the first day of your married life, which may be an indication of what's to come with your marriage. So over to Lily. Let me pray for us um, as we as we respond to Lily's message. So, Father God, would you open our ears to hear your word and would you open our hearts um, to yield to your will right now as we hear Lily's words? Amen. Amen. So this evening, I'm going to be sharing about the parable of the sheep and the goats that Jesus used to explain what will happen when he comes again. I'd encourage you to open up your Bible at Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40. So in this parable, Jesus talks about all the nations gathering before him when he comes in his glory. He says he'll separate the people. Now, in those days, um, sheep and goats would graze together, but they'd be separated out for the sheep to be sheared. So Jesus says that he'll put some on his right and some on his left as a shepherd would she separate the sheep and the goats. And then he'll say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. They'll be confused and they'll ask him, when they did these things and he will say truly I tell you whatever you did for one of these the least of my brothers and sisters you did for me then he's 
then Jesus says that God will turn to those on his right and say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. And I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Again, they will ask when they did not do these things. And he will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I've got a friend uh, who's amazing. She's an ICU nurse in Bristol, and she's been working incredibly hard throughout this time. And she's had an absolute nightmare with... Um, driving and uh, so she'd been taking lessons and she had a car and she just needed to pass a test and um, but just as she was about to take a test we went into lockdown and obviously it got cancelled and as an ICU nurse it's not great getting the bus into work um during this time and then going in and treating people in ICU and um, so she ended up writing on like the local community page to ask if anyone could help her out and to her amazement loads of people came back to her um, and one in particular lady um, offered and ended up giving her a lift to every single shift for nine weeks and that was included in night shifts as well and I was amazed and challenged and I felt so challenged by this lady who doesn't even know God herself but was willing to do such a kind and generous thing and not accepting anything in return. And that's a huge challenge, isn't it, to us as Christians? How much more should we be doing if we've got the strength and love of Jesus? So in this parable in verse 40, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. This is the verse that I really want to hone in on. And what I love about this lady who gave my friend Katie a lift to work is that I just think it captures what this parable teaches us about our purpose as Christians in this amazing act of generosity. And what the parable is really saying is that how we treat one another is a measure of how we treat Jesus. So in other words, how we treat Jesus is measured by how we treat one another. In Genesis, it says that we're made in God's image. I love that. Think about it. Each one of us is made in God's likeness. All are valuable, unique, wonderful, all are precious and all are loved. So we should be generous to others as if they are precious, valuable and loved. And I think this is what Jesus is getting at when he says, what you did for me, one of the least of my brothers. He's classing them as himself, his own unique and loved design. Do we think of others like that? So when we treat others with kindness and generosity, we're treating Jesus with kindness and generosity. And when we don't treat others with kindness and generosity, we don't treat Jesus with kindness and generosity. And in James chapter 2, verse 14 to 15, we read that faith without action is pointless. What a challenge, pointless. So we're called to this life of generosity. And it's not supernatural things. It's being open to God's gentle nudge. It might be responding to what's put on the St. Michael's Connect page um, from someone who's asking for help. It's offering someone a lift. Uh, it's sitting down to chat with someone begging and offering them a drink. And doing it when we don't feel like it or for people who we don't feel like helping. When Jesus talks about loving our enemies in Matthew 5, verse 46, he says, For if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
in other words don't just love your friends that's easy and everyone does that and it's not about exhausting ourselves and doing everything we can under the sun but it's about being god open to god's calling and using the opportunities that he puts before us when i was 18 um, and we'd just become old enough um, me and my friends would go out partying in, in Liverpool at the weekends um, and we'd always end up in McDonald's, which was the highlight. Um, but through that time, I felt called to order food for the homeless guy who was sat outside McDonald's. So almost every time I was there, I would end up getting this, um, this man McDonald's. And, and that is something that I felt challenged to at the time. And... Um, it hasn't continued looking exactly like that, but that was what I felt called to at the time. And on another occasion, years ago, someone I knew vaguely well was asking around if anyone would help them out with something um, that they really needed help with. And I didn't want to go because I didn't really know them and it was going to take four to five hours, but I didn't really have much on that day. And I just felt like I should offer. And this parable popped into my head and I asked myself, would I help this person if it was Jesus? And the answer was, yeah, of course. So I did. And in the end, the thing they needed help with got cancelled. And I was so relieved. <laughs> and, and God brought to mind for me the story um, of Abraham and Isaac. You know, when God challenged Abraham to sacrifice his son just to see where his heart was. And that situation was so much bigger than mine, but I just felt like God wanted to know where my heart was and he wanted to know that I was willing. And I'm sure there's been loads of times when I've missed God's gentle nudge to do something generous and kind. Now you might be thinking, this just isn't for me. And in loads of ways, this, e the, this ethos is quite contrary to the culture we're involved that we live in now, where we're told to focus on making ourselves happy. We have to pray to, God, to ask God to open our hearts and be willing. A good starting point is asking God to help us see that we're made in God's image, that we'll see others as God's perfect, wonderful design, precious and valuable, and acts will flow from that. Well, that incredible song, Hosanna, where it says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Ask God to work in your heart. So I want to share that thought with you that often pops into my head when there's an opportunity to be generous. Would I do that for Jesus? And that awesome challenge that how we treat others is a measure of how we treat Jesus. And to end in the word of Paul in Colossians, whatever you do, whether in thought or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. It's Colossians 3 verse 17. So as we go out into discussion groups in a moment, I'm going to ask you to have a think about um, four particular questions. So what do you think of that statement, how we treat others is a measure of how we treat Jesus? How does that challenge you? Um, what stories of generosity have you heard um, that have encouraged or inspired you? What sets Christians apart from those who aren't yet Christians when we do these acts of generosity? And how does God nudge you? So I just want to pray for us as we um, go out into these discussion rooms. Um, Lord God, thank you for the incredible gift of yourself to us. Thank you for your provision in our lives. Lord, we're sorry when we've um, missed opportunities that we've had to be generous and share your love with others. Help us, Lord, when we are in these moments to think about whether we would do that thing if it was for you. Yeah, Lord, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Soften our hearts. 
thank you for this amazing parable that teaches us so much. Lord, about your will for us. Amen. Well, thank you, Mrs. Morris. Uh, that was absolutely great. Um, and much to think about, lots to chew over, lots to mull on. And we're going to do that now. So you're very welcome to join us. You don't have to, but very welcome to join us for our Zoom chat that is going to launch right now. I'll be there. And uh, do come. We've got a few questions. I'm going to read out the questions now so you can start thinking about them now. Um, so what do you think of the statement, how we treat others? is a measure of how we treat Jesus and how does that challenge you because <laughs> it really challenges me what stories of generosity have you heard that have encouraged or inspired you and how does God nudge you in the day-to-day -day? how does he nudge you and finally what sets Christians apart from those who aren't yet Christians when we do acts of generosity. So these are quite weighty questions. Can't promise that we're gonna get to the bottom of bottom of each and every one, but certainly it should be a brilliant um, platform for some excellent chat. So come and join us in a moment and I'll see you there.